Welcome to Crosstalk Solutions. My name's Chris, and today we're going to be checking out the Cisco RV345P uh, small and medium business router firewall. Uh, that's right. Cisco, okay, so you guys mostly know me as a ubiquity channel. However, Cisco, the big daddy of networking and firewalls, uh, reached out to me and they wanted me to check out this product. And of course, the first thing I asked them, you know, knowing Cisco from way back when, I mean, I haven't personally administered Cisco stuff for at least 15 years. So I'm not too familiar with what they've been up to in the meantime. But the first thing I asked them was, what about the licensing, right? How, what kind of licensing do you guys have on this product? Because if it's some sort of, you know, Cisco SmartNet or whatever they call it, you know, the annual license fees that end up costing more than the device itself, I'm not interested in talking about it. So with this product, the RV345P, and apparently a lot of their small business products, they've now gotten away from that enterprise licensing model. Uh, this device has no licensing fees, it has a limited lifetime warranty, it has lifetime software updates, and it includes one year of free tech support. So this, uh, let's go ahead and get this thing unboxed. I, it's been sitting in my office for like three months probably. And the price on this router, so this is called the RV345P Dual WAN POE VPN router. Okay, so it's marketed as a VPN router and it does have power over ethernet. So here's the device itself. Pretty compact form factor. Let's put that aside for now and see what else is in the box here. Oh, this is heavy. Oh my God, look at the size of this power brick. <laughs> no wonder they've got it so small and light. Yeah, this is super small and light because you've got a humongous power brick in here. Look at that thing. Uh, it does look like it comes with some rack mount ears. So for those of you who want to rack mount this into a uh, 1U standard rack mount or a 19 inch rack. And then of course it has a power cable. It has some rubber feet if you don't want to mount it into a rack as well as the screws. And then this is, oh, an ethernet cable. All right, so on Amazon, the Cisco RV345P is $471.21. Now I'm gonna to mention too, apparently, and the Cisco rep that contacted me about this told me, there are knockoffs that can be uh, that are on Amazon, right? So if you buy a knockoff Cisco RV345P, I don't know if it's a knockoff, but maybe it's like a reseller thing or, or something. If it's like not an authorized reseller, the warranty may not be valid unless you get it from an official Cisco partner or something. If you look at Amazon, and uh, I have a link down below, if you click on that link, that is an affiliate link by the way, if you click on that link, you'll see that that is for the Cisco Systems seller, right? So you wanna make sure that if you're buying one of these on Amazon, you wanna get it from Cisco, and that way you know that the warranty is going to be legit. Wow, it's actually pretty nice looking. So uh, here we have 16 ports. Now the first, the first eight ports are PoE. Okay, so that's 802.3 AF and AT, I believe. So you've got eight ports of PoE, you've got eight gigabit ports of non-PoE, then you have two WAN ports. So this is a dual WAN router. It's specifically marketed as a dual WAN router. Then we have a USB port here. And the USBs are for type A USB port that supports flash drives and 3G, 4G, LTE USB dongles. So it looks like you can use the USB port for additional storage. Uh, there's one on the front and there's one on the side here. And it's just USB 2.0, but it looks like you can use that for like LTE failover. Maybe I'll see some more information about that when I dig into the interface. On the back, we have a power switch, a toggle power switch. We have the power input and we have a console input that you would use your console cable for. Although look at this console cable. The console they, cable that they give you is RJ45 for the back of the Cisco and then nine pin serial for the front. I'm not really used to seeing that so much anymore. I certainly don't have a nine pin serial port on my computer. And normally what we get these days with console cables are these ones, which are uh, USB two to RJ45 instead of serial, nine pin serial to RJ45. So that's kind of an interesting choice. And again, 
I haven't been in the Cisco world in forever, so I'm sure there's a lot of people in the comments that are going to be like, come on, Chris, 9-pin serial is standard when you're administering Cisco stuff. Okay, that's great. I just, I'm not used to it, so I haven't seen a 9-pin serial connection in quite some time. All right, so let me go uh, get this thing plugged in and fired up, and we're going to take a look at the installation wizard and try to get this Cisco box uh, set up appropriately. Uh, what I've done here is I have plugged in a WAN port from my internet connection, and I have plugged my computer in to one of the LAN ports, one of the non-POE LAN ports. That's all I've done so far, and we brought up the main page here, which is 192.168.1.1. 1 .1. So we're going to go ahead and log in for the first time, and proceed. And here we go, Cisco Router. So the default username and password is all lowercase Cisco and Cisco. So we're going to type that in now. Okay, wow. Okay, so let's see. Local user password complexity. So this is going to, I guess this is giving us our minimum password length and mi minimum number of character classes, which I imagine are uppercase, lowercase, numerical, and special characters. So basically we're saying... You got to have at least eight characters and they have to be some mix of uppercase, lowercase, numerical, or special characters, but only three out of four of those. And the new password must be different from the current one. Okay, so I like that the, uh, the first thing you log in and see is a focus on security and it's telling you to change the password immediately. So let's go ahead and change the password. Um, so we're going to put in the old password of Cisco and then we're going to generate a new password with LastPass because that usually gives a nice strong password. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I did 12 characters and a mix of uppercase, lowercase, numerical, and special characters generated out of LastPass, and it's giving me yellow on the strength meter. <laughs> so let, let me crank that up. We're going to go higher than that. Okay, there we go. Now I have all greens. That was 24 characters, and then lowercase, uppercase, numerical, and special characters, and it gave me the green on the password strength meter. All right, let's go ahead and save that. Okay, and it's going to have us log back in. Okay, initial setup wizard pops up automatically. This setup wizard helps you install your Cisco router. Now, for anyone watching this, I want to be clear that I am not a Cisco expert. Okay, this is the first Cisco router I've touched in probably 15 years. Okay, so I am going through this setup wizard along with you for the first time. So don't look at this video as, hey, these are the best practice setup ideas for a Cisco router because that's not what this is. This is me showing you the interface uh, just as I'm seeing it for the first time in a long time. Okay, so with that caveat, this setup wizard helps you install your Cisco router. Before you begin, make sure the router is connected to an internet gateway device. Okay, good enough. Next, uh, check connection on WAN 1. Network connection has been detected. Great, next. Configure your router set connection type. So I'm gonna set this to a static IP address, which I'm gonna do mostly off camera here so you guys can't see my WAN IP address, static IP address, and next. And now it wants me to populate my static IP address information. Okay, now we're saying our time zone. Let's put me to UTC minus eight Pacific time. And yes, let's enable en enable NTP. That would be great. Next. Each device on your network has its own has a MAC address. In most cases, you should choose default address. If your ISP requires you to connect using a specific MAC address, you may change it here. Okay, my ISP does not require that, so we're just going to use the default and say next. Please review the following settings and ensure the data is correct. It looks good to me. We're going to say next. Enable security. Set router password. The administrative router password protects your router from unauthorized access. For security reasons, you should change the router password from its default setting. All right, so we already did that. So we're going to say keep current password and we're going to say submit. Congratulations, your router has been set up successfully. Okay. I've had a few days to play around with this Cisco RV345P now and uh, everything's been really, really solid. I, uh, I'm going to do a little tour through the interface. This is by no means meant to be a comprehensive review. That would take me like three hours, right, to show you absolutely everything. Uh, so I did run into one quirk while setting this up. You know how I had done that really strong password during the initial setup wizard? Well, the next day I logged into the Cisco again, and for some reason it made me change my password again, and I don't know why. Like, I couldn't get past it. I logged in with the strong password that I had set, and it's like, nope, you got to change your password. So I went through that, and it actually hasn't happened again since, so I don't know why it makes you change your password in the initial setup wizard, and then it made me do it again the next day. I might have done something wrong, I don't know. But that's the only sort of quirky thing that I've run into so far with this device. 
Here we have the getting started page and you can see that I've made some changes because we have the blinking, you know, three and a half inch floppy disk icon in the upper right hand corner, which by the way, how long are we still gonna use three and a, three and a half inch floppy drives as a save icon? Uh, very soon people are not gonna have any idea what that is. Uh, so like all Cisco gear, when you make changes, those changes are applied immediately, meaning that your running configuration uh, is going to reflect those changes. But if you reboot, if you have not saved your running configuration to your saved configuration, you're gonna lose those changes upon reboot. So basically it allows you to try things out and then of course revert those changes if you don't uh, want them. So you can see here that this bugs me to save the running configuration. If I click on that icon, it's gonna bring me over here and we can say save configuration from running config to the startup config or a backup config or we can download it or whatever. Uh, or you can just disable the save icon blinking. <laughs> so we're just gonna apply these changes. I don't even know what changes I made, but we're gonna apply them anyways. And now let's take a look through the interface. So if we click on status and statistics, this is gonna give you a general overview of what's happening in the firewall. So your ports, your port speed, connectivity, firmware version, uptime, CPU memory usage, etc. There's not really too much in here to talk about. You can see that there's just a lot of statistics that you can look at over here on the left-hand side. One thing I did like, however, though, was view logs. I really like the logging functionality and the ability to filter down to just the stuff that you wanna see within the log files. So for instance, I set up a VPN connection uh, between my computer, which is in, here I'll show you. Here you can see my computer is DHCP'd into 192.168.200.227, which is the LAN network behind my edge router. Okay, so I'm in my standard edge router LAN. I have a VPN tunnel set up from the edge router to the Cisco firewall. And so you can see, even though I'm in the 200 LAN, I am able to access the interface of the Cisco, which is over here in the 201, 192.168.201 LAN, which by the way, I changed the IP address. <laughs> it comes by default as 192.168.1.1. I changed over to 192.168.201.1 uh, for the IP of the Cisco. So as I was saying, debugging VPN was very helpful to simply just uncheck everything and only check the VPN log files or anything that was related to VPN in the logs. That worked out really, really well. It actually allowed me to find a problem uh, getting the VPN working between these two uh, firewalls. If you click on administration, this allows you to see, you know, your firmware version allows you to upgrade the device manually or from cisco.com. Mine came with the latest firmware, so I didn't have to worry about any of that. It also allows you to do general diagnostics work, such as rebooting, uh, managing certificates, et cetera. We're not gonna cover that too much. Let's go on to system configuration. System configuration is where you have a lot of the more general settings for the device, so you can set up your schedules. So for instance, if you wanna set up the content filtering, the web filtering, but you only wanna set that up during business hours or something like that, you can set schedules for all of that sort of stuff. You can manage your users. Uh, user accounts, user groups, administrators, etc. You could set up SNMP, uh, NTP, uh, the email address and SMTP settings for the server uh, or for the firewall. All of that is over here in system configuration. So cool, very cool that it has all this functionality, but uh, I'm not gonna cover too much of that. If we click on WAN, this shows us our WAN interfaces. Now we can see that I'm only currently using WAN 1, but if I was using WAN 1 and WAN 2 as a multi-WAN setup, and also possibly using LTE backup, I could come over here to multi-WAN, and this is really cool. Multi-WAN allows me to load balance my WAN connections, not just by percentage, so like I could say 50% down WAN 1 and 50% down WAN 2, I could also do it weighted by bandwidth, so I, could, I can load balance based on megabits per second. So that's pretty cool too. You know, again, I don't know where you would want to use one or the other, but it is really, really nice to see such easy uh, multi-WAN load balancing that allows you to load balance not only multiple WAN connections through Ethernet, but also the two USB ports for LTE backup connectivity. And then also in WAN, you can set up your mobile network stuff, you can set up dynamic DNS, uh, et cetera. All right, let's click on LAN. And there's a lot that you can do in LAN. I think this is where most people are gonna be spending their time if they are configuring this Cisco firewall. Uh, you can do your ports, 
uh, port statistics, port settings, uh, PoE settings, uh, link aggregation, mirroring, VLAN settings, all of that is under the LAN category. For PoE settings, it's pretty standard. So you have eight ports of PoE in this device. And you can not only though, this is something I've actually never seen before, you can not only edit your ports, so here's LAN port one, you can not only edit whether PoE is enabled or disabled on the port, you can also specify a maximum milliwatt of outage of, of power outage, right? So, or what they call power power allocation. So in other words, you can say, hey, listen, port one, I only ever want a maximum of 10 watts out of this port. So for instance, an access point or a phone is gonna be somewhere between like four to six watts of output. You can actually lock it down so that a single port can't use too much wattage, which I think is pretty cool. I've never seen that feature before. Here we can see, for instance, I have a, uh, UAP AC Pro that I set up. So we're gonna talk about the VLANs in just a second. I have this set up just as a sort of test with a guest network, and we can see that is plugged into port nine. It's powered by PoE. My maximum power allocation is 30,000 milliwatts, but this device itself is only pulling uh, 3,600 milliwatts or 3.6 watts. So yeah, that's pretty cool. Uh, you can see all of that and you can even lock it down. So I might want to come in here to LAN port nine and lock it down so that the maximum power allocation is only, you know, 5,000 watts or we'll say 6,000 watts, which should be more than enough for uh, just powering one access point. All right, if we click on our VLAN settings, this is where I set up an extra VLAN. So basically I just have uh, Unify, my cloud hosted Unify, I went into that cloud host and Unify, I added a new guest Wi-Fi network on VLAN 10, and then all of the guest settings, like the client isolation, the bandwidth allocation per guest and stuff, all of that is gonna be handled in Unify. And all I did here was set up VLAN 10 as 192.168.10.0 slash 24 network with a DHCP server. So let's go ahead and edit this, and you can see all of the settings for VLAN 10. So here's my IP range, DHCP is set to server, we've got our start and stop ranges, uh, our DNS settings that we're handing out, and then you've got your DHCP options down below. Now it only has option 66, 150, 67, and 43 as possible DHCP options. I There's a ton more DHCP options than that, but I wasn't able to find where you can set those up. Not saying that you can't set those up, but in my sort of brief overview and my investigation into this interface, I wasn't able to find where you can set up additional DHCP options or even you know, customize your own DHCP options if you wanted to. You also have your IPv6 settings over here on the right with uh, IPv6 DHCP as well if you need to set that up. Then we have our LAN slash DHCP settings. So this is another place where you can configure your DHCP servers. And this allows you to have a little bit of a DHCP wizard that you can walk through. So for instance, if I check VLAN 10 and I say edit, you have a few steps that you can walk through. So here we can uh, say disabled server or pass DHCP to a different DHCP server. Click next, we're gonna keep it as the server. And then here's all of our DHCP options that we saw on that last screen. And then if we say next, then we can choose what to do for IPv6 as well. In this case, we're gonna leave it disabled, click okay. And now I've set up a new DHCP or modified the DHCP settings for VLAN 10. Next, we have routing. Uh, this is for more advanced routing, RIP and IGMP, static routing entries that you wanna enter. I'm not gonna cover too much of that because I'm not doing any fancy routing. Uh, but of course, this is Cisco. So you're gonna be able to do all of that sort of good stuff. Same thing with firewall. Like I said, I'm, I'm not gonna go into the firewall too much. I didn't dig into it too much myself, but I imagine that anything you'd ever wanna do with a firewall, you could do with this device. So we've got access rules, network address translation, static NAT settings, port forwarding, port triggering, uh, DMZ settings, etc. One thing that I do like though, is that SIP ALG and universal plug and play are both disabled by default, which they should be. All right, let's click on VPN because this is marketed as a VPN firewall and boy howdy, <laughs> there is so much you can do with VPN. Just look at the settings down here on the left-hand side. VPN status, IPsec profiles, site-to-site -site VPN, client-to-site -site VPN, teleworker VPN, PPTP, L2TP, uh, SSL VPN, GRE tunnel VPN pass-through, right? So there's a ton of settings related to VPNs 
And since it was, since there were so many settings, I decided that I wanted to attempt to set up VPN between this Cisco box and my Edge Router 4, which is my main firewall. And I was able to do it. It took me about 45 minutes to an hour of sort of troubleshooting and trying to figure out how to get the setup working. Uh, and it was actually a little bit trickier in the Edge Router than it was in the Cisco. And when I say trickier, I just mean like I first just tried to set up VPN on both sides using the GUI of both the Edge Router and the Cisco. But on the Edge Router side, I actually had to delete everything that I did in the GUI and then flip over to the CLI to set up VPN via CLI on the Edge Router side. But on the Cisco side, I was able to set up all of the you know matching settings for the VPN right through the GUI. So I have yet to have to log into the, the CLI of this Cisco firewall. Everything I've been able to do, I was able to do with the GUI. So here we can see that I have one tunnel used out of 49 and 49 tunnels left available. You have a total of 50 tunnels that you can use uh, in this firewall. And what I ended up doing, and by the way, let me know if you guys wanna see a separate video on how I did the VPN tunnel between these two devices. I'm happy to do a separate video on that if anyone's interested. Essentially though, I went in here, I set up a new IPsec profile specifically for the edge router. And then I came over to site to site VPN settings. And in here we can see the site to site VPN that I set up and you can edit it and then you have all of the various um, you know, VPN settings that you would expect. Uh, to have to set up in order to match two sides of a site-to-site -site IPsec VPN connection. If we click on security, this is where we get into some of the application control stuff where you can actually create you know, filters for Facebook and Tinder and whatever you might want to block out, uh, torrenting, etc. If you come down here to web filtering, we can add a new web filter policy which uh, you know, basically has all of these things built in by default, but you can add additional ones. If we go to application control, uh, this allows you to add different policies where you can say, okay, let's edit our application list table. So for instance, if we wanted to go to social networking, look at all these different social networks that you can block. So if we wanted to block you know, Twitter, and we're gonna say uh, block and log, you can also permit and log, which I would say you know, if you're gonna be setting something like this up, like we wanna block Facebook, well, start off by doing permit and log, right? That way you can at least see which of your users are hammering on Facebook most often first before you actually block it and maybe put out some memos about, hey, you shouldn't be on Facebook type of stuff. If we apply that, we can see I've added two social network uh, applications to the list and then we can either block or permit and choose whether or not to log uh, traffic that's going to those different social networks. Now, the interesting thing though, is there's not a lot in here, right? So like, if, for instance, if we look on dating, there's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine different dating applications that you can block via the application control firewall. And I mean, I don't, I'm not on any dating apps, okay? But I know that there's a lot more than the ones that are listed here. Like, I mean, match.com, right? They're like one of the biggest ones out there as far as I know, and I don't see match.com on here. So how do you block that? You probably wanna do that with DNS filtering instead, okay? So there's much more powerful options for blocking this type of stuff, for instance, with Cisco Umbrella. So let's click on Cisco Umbrella. Cisco Umbrella is basically like OpenDNS for enterprise. So Cisco bought OpenDNS, and that is sort of their small business and home user DNS filtering service. Then they have Cisco Umbrella, which Cisco Umbrella is a more robust filtering service made for enterprise, okay? So I'm probably gonna do a separate video on Cisco Umbrella because I do get a 14 day free trial and I would like to dig in and sort of see their implementation of DNS filtering, but I'm sure it's a lot more comprehensive than what you actually get just in the interface of the Cisco, right? So if I were managing an enterprise, I probably wouldn't let the, this device itself do any of the application filtering I would probably do that by virtue of you know something like Cisco Umbrella or OpenDNS and then just force users to use those specific DNS servers when they're surfing the web. Down here at the bottom, we also have threat and IPS where we can see statistics for the built-in traffic antivirus and intrusion prevention. Okay, so let's take a look at, for instance, IPS. Here we go. And so if IPS is enabled, so we'll turn this on and apply that, uh, we can see 
Uh, are we logging only? Are we blocking attacks? And then what's the security level that we're using? This is just uh, it's connectivity means least protection, balanced is medium, and then security is high protection. And then you can see the attack signatures down below. They got 58 pages of attack signatures uh, that you can look through. One thing that I don't know about is whether or not turning on IPS throttles down the total throughput of the firewall, right? So for instance, in Ubiquity world, we all we all know that like you turn on IPS, you don't get as much bandwidth or throughput as you do when IPS is disabled because you've got a lot of CPU pro power being used to sort of look at every packet that's coming in and out of the firewall to, you know, see what it can prevent or just make sure you're looking for those attack signatures. So I didn't find any statistics on whether the throughput of the device is diminished by virtue of enabling IPS. Uh, however, I did find that this device has 950 megabits per second of standard throughput, like if you don't have anything crazy going on, and 650 megabits per second of VPN throughput. So just wanted to throw that out there. I don't remember if I mentioned that earlier in the video or not. All right, then we've got quality of service. Uh, I added a quality of service for SIP. I was just playing around with it, but you've got all of the standard quality of service stuff that you would expect out of a Cisco router. And then some configuration wizards like the initial setup wizard, application control wizard, and VPN setup wizard, which I did not use the VPN setup wizard when I set up the VPN, I just did it manually. If we click on license, we can see that I don't currently have a license. Uh, I'm in evaluation mode for 88 days. In fact, let me do this. Let me go sign up for a license and I will paste it in here and see what it looks like after I've, you know, uh, officially licensed this firewall. I am now registered with this device. There were a few hoops that I had to jump through since I didn't have a Cisco account. I had to create an account, then I had to create like a company account. Both had to be verified through email and all this sort of stuff. And when all of that was said and done, I get to this screen which says that I'm registered, but I'm out of compliance. And by out of compliance, they're basically saying I have negative one license or insufficient licenses for the RV series security services license. So again, I was under the impression that this device does not have to be licensed. And uh, frankly, I'm not about to go down the rabbit hole of Cisco licensing and try to figure this out. So. Uh, I'm just gonna send an email to my Cisco contact and ask about this and see, you know, maybe I did something wrong or maybe my account just, you know, maybe there was something in the box that I was supposed to add as a license or something. I don't really even know. All right, I am here in downtown Portland. I edited that video yesterday, but then got some additional information about the licensing, the Cisco licensing. And essentially what it is, is they sell on top of the price of the firewall, they sell for $121.99 an annual license that gets you into all of the security features. So anything that's under that security tab, one of the last things that I showed in the interface, that's gonna be the content filtering, the antivirus, the intrusion prevention, all of that stuff, those are all licensed features of the firewall. So you can actually have the firewall, the firewall, the routing, the VPN stuff, everything else is included with no license required. If you want the additional security stuff, so the content filtering and all of that, then you're gonna pay an annual license of $121.99. But they actually recommended if you aren't gonna use any of those extra security features, you don't even need to license the device at all. You don't have to go through what I did to get it licensed where it's showing that negative one license thing. Okay, so. Hope that helps and back to the video. So let's talk about overall impressions of this device. Overall, this is a very solid firewall, as I expected it to be. I mean, even when I received the box, I was like, yeah, this is gonna be a good firewall. It's Cisco. Cisco's been around forever. They know what they're doing in networking. Uh, I have not had this in production. Uh, if you guys do have these in production, let me know how they are down below. I'd love to hear your feedback on these, but I imagine that they're fine. I mean, I would have no qualms about buying one of these for a client and putting it into production. I'm sure it would be just fine for any SMB client. And one thing I will say about this device though, is that they absolutely do not dumb it down at all for beginners. Okay, so this is not a beginner's firewall. If you're looking for a beginner's firewall, go get a Netgear Nighthawk or something, right? <laughs> and put that in your home. You would not have this in your home. This is a device, unless you're looking to really like learn firewalls and networking, that's when you would wanna have this in your home. But this is more for like small to medium businesses that have an internet connection that's, you know, sub gigabit. 
As far as the pricing goes, the pricing for this device is $471.21. They also have a non-power over ethernet version that is $338.16. I'm fine with the price. Keep in mind that it comes with one year of free Cisco tech support. So I can't tell you how many times people bought like a ubiquity firewall, they run into trouble setting it up and then they have to hire us, you know, hourly to figure it out for them. You end up spending more than the cost of the firewall in the setup and support to get it running. So paying $471 for this firewall with 16 switch ports, eight of which are PoE, and you get a year of tech support from Cisco, that's really not that bad a, de not bad a deal, right? It's not a bad deal. Because that tech support itself is gonna be worth something. You wouldn't have to hire a third party to help you figure it out. You can actually contact Cisco and say, hey, this isn't working, or how do I do this, or blah, 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 right? And Cisco, I haven't used their support, but I'm sure it's fine, and they will be able to help you get it dialed in. I mean, I like this device. It's a Cisco. I, You know, it's a great firewall. I'm sure it's going to be just fine in SMB. And uh, yeah, again, I don't think I'm personally going to start selling these. I want to figure out the licensing stuff. If there's anything else that you guys would like to see with this firewall, I'm interested in maybe doing a video on the VPN, the IPsec site-to-site -site VPN between the Cisco and my edge router. I would also like to do a video on Cisco's umbrella DNS filtering service. Uh, any other videos or questions that you have, put them down in the comments below. I'd be happy to take a look at those. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you give me a thumbs up. And if you'd like to see more videos like this, please click that subscribe button. All right, my name is Chris with Crosstalk Solutions, and thank you so much for watching.